All right, hello and welcome to lecture 15. So this is the last real set of slides that I have for you. It might take two lectures to go through them, but this is essentially it. Uh, and then I'll just start reviewing. And please ask lots of questions and I'll uh, get to your questions first. So uh, we'll go uh, over those first today. Uh, but first, before all of that, just some logistical stuff. So we are here. There is technically a holiday on Monday, so there is no class. So we are here if you're watching this on the right day. Uh, and the final exam is a week and a day from now, possibly. So uh, just make sure that is on the back of your mind. Uh, this exam, if I remember it right, and I read it off gold correctly, uh, it's going to be from 12 to 3. That's the normal time. And so I'm going to release it 30 minutes before then, like I usually do on Gradescope. Uh, it'll be called a normal name, like final, uh, and I'll leave it open for 24 hours, uh, and I will be available for the entirety of that final time. So I'll be here from 12 to 3 on Zoom uh, to answer any questions that you have if you choose to take it during that time. Okay, and um, then there's a bunch of topics, and I, uh, I have pre-made like a review CPP file that I will go through uh, in one of the future lectures that covers all of these. Uh, and then please also ask me questions. I'll, of course, post all the solutions to the homeworks. Uh, there's some also some cool stuff from a previous professor with these two links. Uh, take a look at those. And then, of course, uh, past things and past finals. Uh, I don't think I have the answers. Everything that I have, I put on the internet. So uh, I don't think I have the answers to these finals. So just ask me about them or anybody about them in office hours or through Piazza. And we'll, uh, if you can't figure a question out, we'll try and figure it out together. Okay, uh, so that's everything there. Uh, and now let's get to your questions. So uh, let, us, let us talk about them. So the first one, will we ever prefer to use an array of characters or C strings instead of a C++ string? Uh, and the goal is no. We're using C++ so that we never have to use these horrible old style C strings, uh, but sometimes you are forced to use such strings. And the normal case for that is when you're getting command line arguments from main. You have no choice but to take an array of C strings, and this is why I am teaching you how to use them. Uh, you're going to have to one day use C strings for something or another, and that is why they are important to know about. Uh, so that's that. Uh, because we're in C++, it makes more sense to use C++ strings. So let me, let me put that up here before I get into the next stuff. You should always prefer to use C++ strings. They're a lot more user-friendly. Uh, alternative. Also, uh, you can look into something. There's like a C++ version of an array that I don't think I'll have time to get to in this class. Uh, similarly, there's also a C++ version of an array called a vector. Uh, look into the vector. standard library uh, page if you're interested. Vectors are going to be super helpful if you ever take CS24 and they just abstract away a lot of unfortunate facts about arrays and they make them easier to use. Like you can actually resize these things called vectors, which is fun. Uh, but yeah, there are C++ versions of things and we would always like to prefer them, but sometimes we're forced to use other things. So that is that. Uh, Please ask any follow-up questions that you can think of. Uh, the next one, uh, how do we do homework eight? Of course, I'm going to release these uh, solutions in, I think, a day. So uh, please ask me about individual questions if the answers that I'm going to post don't make any sense. So I will go through five and eight. Uh, but if you have any questions on other ones, please just let me know uh, on this page again. All right. So here is homework eight and number five. So this is a prime candidate for a recursive solution. Uh, there's definitely a way to do this. There's a way to implement this function, 
iteratively using loops, but it is a huge pain and anybody who tried to do it that way, I'm sure you realized how big of a pain that is. I had a student come to office hours, and I think I still have the notes open about what you need to do to keep track of, to actually do this correctly. Uh, and this is, this could possibly still have errors, I don't know. Uh, but the idea is, if you're going to do it with a loop, like I've tried to do it here, uh, you have to save, like, the previous node. You see that? So you're iterating through the list, like, all right, here's my current node, I want to delete it. Well, in order to do that, I need to then change this previous node's next pointer, because this, this guy's going away, which is no fun. So you have to, like, save instead of, in addition to the node that you're currently considering, the previous node in the list. So you can do this kind of uh, tricky business. Uh, and then, what happens if you're considering the first node in the list when you have no previous yet? What? What do you do there? Uh, so there's a bunch of special cases, and... That is why this is a huge, it's a huge improvement to use recursion instead. And uh, I will talk about the recursive solution to a version of this problem uh, in the slides I'm going to talk about today. So I will get to this answer in the slides, not to worry. Uh, I do it slightly differently with an actual return type, but uh, you'll see how this, re this reference to a node pointer is used when I release the solutions. I'm going to give an answer to this question in the slides today. So we're covered there. And number eight. So that's where we go backwards from the example that I gave. Uh, instead of going from the diagram to a table, we go from the table to a diagram. So uh, this is very important to, to understand, and so I'm going to go through this step by step. And I encourage you to go back to whatever lecture that I talked about all this stuff. Here it is, lecture 12 it seems, where I did all this the opposite way. So I went from the, t the diagram to the table, uh, now we're going to go backwards. Okay, So it's important to remember the data structures that we're working with. We have linked lists, nodes, and in our main function we have a pointer to a linked list called list, and that's what we're given uh, at the start of this, uh, this problem. We have a pointer to a linked list, a pointer to a linked list, it's called list, and we are told that that lives at this particular address, and 0x just means the number that comes after it is written in hexadecimal, not to be confused with decimal. Okay, that's all that means. So we know that if we declare a list pointer like this in main, it's going to live on the stack, and usually we make our lists on the heap, so things look like this eventually. Uh, that's the idea. And then we have this variable, this local variable called list, and it's a pointer to a linked list. So it's called list. It's a pointer to a linked list, which means it holds an address. It's not a linked list yet with a head and a tail pointer. It's just a pointer to one of those. It holds the address of usually something on the heap that is a linked list object. And so this list variable, we are told, lives at address 0x. 8008, right? Yep. Oh, and before I forget, I'm going to start a timer for myself. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. All right, so we have this information. And so the idea is, list is a pointer. It lives at this address, but what's its value? It holds a value as, uh, it holds an address as a value because it's a pointer. So uh, it's going to be pointing off into the heap somewhere, or maybe just in local memory somewhere. Uh, and our next job is to figure out, all right, what's this value so I can look into the address there, because this thing's a pointer. Alright, so at this address we have 803c. So that's the value. And so what this means is this is the address, because list is a pointer to a linked list, its value is the address of the start of a linked list object, which is one of these. It holds a head and a tail, just like this. So at 803c, is the start of a linked list object. The first thing is the head, the second thing is a tail, and I forgot a semicolon. Just to be pedantic, I'm gonna put one in. And so we know that at the start, uh, 803c in the first four bytes there, because every pointer is four bytes long, we're going to first have the head, and then we're gonna have the tail in the next four bytes. This is eight bytes total. 
because we got two pointers. And so after 803C, we have 80DEF0, uh, 8040, all right? So, and then we know that at these addresses, we have two values, and the first value is a pointer to a node, and the second value is a pointer to a node, all right? So they're going to branch off like this, and they're going to be nodes at that, at that point. Uh, so let's look at those values that are stored at these addresses. So at 803C, we got 8,000, and then 8028. I hope that makes sense. And these are, again, pointers to nodes. And so what they mean is, all right, go to address 8,000. You should find a node. Go to address 8,028, you should find a node, all right? And what is a node? Well, it's again eight bytes long because it's got an int and then a pointer to another node, all right? So at 8,000, we have the first part of that node, and at 8,004, we have the next pointer. So here's the data, here's the next. Immediately, when we know that the node starts at this address, it's going to be eight bytes long. It has to be. And again, same for the tail. At the start, we have the data, and then in the next four bytes, starting at address 802.9.10.9a, b, c, 802c, we have the next pointer. All right, so let's go and fill in these values now. 8,000, we have 808, and this is a trick. This is a total trick, because this looks like another pointer, but it's not, it's the data value. 808, and then 8020. So there's an extra node somewhere in between. I'm going to have to like put it right here. And then 8028, we should read off 20. I'm just going to write 20 without any leading zeros. And then this is the null. This, should, this is the last element. It's the tail. It better have a null next pointer. And hey, yes, it does. Zero. Beautiful. Uh, and then all we need to do now is fill in the middle part of this list. Uh, but right now, we've got everything like this. And so this is going to point off to a node. And I think you understand the game now. This lives at 8020. That's the start of a node, because this is a next pointer. It's a node, node star. And so we have a node here. And then uh, it starts at this address. It's 8 bytes long. So first we have the int data. Then we have the node star next, starting at 8024. OK. Let's go and read those off. 5 and 8014. All right, there's an even another node, and I didn't give myself enough room, now did I? We're almost there, though. All right, so that's 5 at 8020, and 8014. Let me just check myself quickly. Then 8030, 8028, okay, cool. All right, so I didn't give myself nearly enough room, and let's uh, let's fix that slightly. Whee. This is really supposed to still be the heap, though. All right, that's probably as good as that's going to get for now. And then, uh, I feel like you should be able to do the rest. Uh, it should make sense in theory. But, so that's the head still. Oop. Uh, it's really pointing to 8,000, so let's just go there. Then you're going here, and then you're going off to 8014, which is... I can just read off a bit faster now. So 8014, the two bytes there, it's 2, and then 8030. And so we can go to another node at 8030. Read off a node. So it's 3 and then 28. 8028. And then finally, we hit the last thing. So this is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, node list. And still, this is really the only thing that's on the stack, sorry. All right, so that's a bit sloppy, but that is the idea. Hopefully, you can read off these values now. And once I release the answers uh, as well, you'll see a probably a prettier version of this. Okay, so that's that. Uh, now, 
let us go on. So uh, please ask me about other homework eight questions. Uh, please give a specific number and I'll go over it if you have any questions. And remember, I'm going to get to five later. And my favorite color is red. Thank you for asking. All right. So now this is ready for the next week. And I can close that too. And now we are ready for the slides, I think. No, we are not because I wrote down that I want to talk about one of those questions from the midterm. So midterm two, brief segue. Uh, when is one time greater than another? And so this is a, a common uh, error in the midterm was to have a time like, uh, here's three times, 7, 49, uh, and then, or no, I just need two, and then 8, 15. All right, so a lot of people uh, determined that a time was greater than another with this if statement. If, uh, like, time x greater than time y. Uh, to check that, you might have done x dot hours greater than y dot hours and x dot minutes greater than y dot minutes. But the issue with this is, given these two times, it'll be false if if this is uh, x and this is y, because the minutes are not greater, so that there needs to be something fancier here that needs to be done. This is why it was a very highly weighted question. Uh, here's the right way to do it. If, so uh, one time is later than another if just the hours are greater, one, just the hours are greater, like that, that example that I gave, or alternatively, the hours are the same, and the minutes are greater. Okay? And that's to do something like 815 versus 817. How do you know that 817 comes later? Well, that's because they have the same hour, and the minutes are... Uh, uh, it has a later minutes. Okay, that is the idea. So the if statement in the end should look something like instead, uh, instead, the right condition is something like, or it is, uh, if x dot hours is greater than y dot hours, or alternatively, x dot hours is equal to y dot hours and x dot minutes is uh, greater than y dot minutes. And there's alternative ways to do that, and uh, if you're interested in any, I can uh, talk to you about them in office hours. All right, so that's the idea there, uh, and that's all I wanted to talk about for that. So now I think we can officially get into the slides, uh, and I doubt we're gonna finish them. Uh, and if we do, I have plenty more to talk about, don't you worry. Uh, so these string problems we did last time, I'll just skip through those. And so this is the cutest example of recursion. Uh, this was made by Professor Mirza here at UCSB. And so if recursion does not make sense yet, it's still a little fuzzy in your mind. This is a very cute little uh, animation that will hopefully help a little bit. So here's this sum list function. And uh, we've talked about it. So it just adds up all the, no the nodes in a, li in a linked list and it gives you back their sum, their total sum of the initial bigger, uh, largest list. Uh, and so pretend that we're gonna call this sum list function starting at the initial node of this big list 10, 50, 40. Okay, that's the idea. And so every time we call this function, it's gonna call itself, remember? And I drew the stack before, and it's just gonna keep on stacking calls to that same function, right? Let's instead pretend if Let's not talk about a stack anymore, let's talk about dolls. So here we have Matryoshka dolls, and they will rep represent calls to this sum list function. And to keep track of what line we're on and executing, we have this cute little turtle that will keep track of that for us. And so uh, every time we call sum list, 
a new doll pops out, and every time we walk through the code, a turtle moves. Okay, so with that, let's get started. Let's see if I can actually, uh, no, I have to show these for a little bit. That's how I can go one at a time. There we go. All right, so we start, and when we call the sum list the first time on the 10 node, uh, head is set to this uh, initial node. So head points to this 10 node right here. And so the turtle is on this line. It's about to make a sum rest variable. Okay, so this is the first call to sum list. We pretend that this line happened in main, for example. All right, so sum rest is now declared but uninitialized. Uh, and then we're going to give it a value by calling sum list uh, inside of itself. All right, so now we have another doll. And our new head for this doll, uh, this stack frame, it's pointing to its current head at 50. So we're, we're giving it the smaller list, the 50-40 at this point. All right, and we're asking it to find the sum of that. So the turtle is ready in this function to make a sum rest variable. Uh, and if you look at the code, there is an error. I'll try to find it. Uh, so again, we're going to make this sum rest function, uh, the sum rest variable, and try to give it a value by calling recursively to find the sum of the smaller list. At this point, it's the 40. All right. So now the turtle is back up here inside of this third smaller doll, third call to the function. Now our head is pointed at this 40 node, and so we're going to make our sum rest variable, and oops, and we're going to then call to find the sum of the smallest list, which is the empty list. All right, and so we have our final little doll, and head is null. Okay, the, I hope you have a sense of impending doom at this point. So the turtle is chilling, it's right here, and uh, the turtle is about to say head arrow next. Remember that the arrow operator dereferences head, uh, and so we're going to seg fault before we're able to call this function because it first needs to get a value for this parameter, for this argument. All right, so we're about to dereference head, which is null. And don't do it, turtle, don't do it, but it has to do it, and we get a seg fault. So that is a problem. And uh, how do we fix this? Well, if only we had a base case, right? So then we could guard against the fact that we'll uh, never call this function recursively on itself when we know we have an empty list and we know immediately how to solve the sum list problem for an empty list we just give back zero right that's the sum of all the nodes in a list full of zero nodes all right so if we then add this base case checking for null we can then return from the smallest doll back to the slightly bigger doll uh, the answer of the sum of the smaller list which is zero all right so now we have some rest sitting here and uh, we get that result back from this doll. And it can then go and add its, uh, its data element to the sum of the small list. And now this whole, this doll will give back 40. Okay, it's this third last one. All right, so it gives back 40, 40 plus zero. Then it pops itself off. And the second doll then sees 40 as the sum of the smallest list, that it, uh, the smaller list in, from its point of view. And it was waiting to add that 40 uh, or that result to its 50, and it goes and does that and returns its answer. And we're executing this line now, all right? 50 plus 40. And now this largest doll that was waiting for the sum of the smallest, the, the smaller list, got back that sum recursively, and now it's about to return 90. Uh, or it's it got back 90, and it's about to add its data value on this line to that sum, and it returns 10 plus 90. And that is the final answer. All right, so that's beautiful. And we walked over a lot of different lines in the same function multiple times. So this, this turtle got around, it did a lot of work, right? Uh, and that's the beauty of recursion. We can just break down problems and not really think about how they're going to get solved. We get to do that kind of assumption where we, uh, we assume that the smaller uh, call to the function works as long as we build it up, uh, build that final answer up properly. So it's beautiful, right? Uh, and so now, uh, let me change this. Let me change this around to say, instead of calling sum list head arrow next, let's instead call sum list of head. Okay? So take a second now to think about what's going to happen when we call sum list like this in the recursive case.
All right. So uh, and I hope you have a good idea as to what might be happening, or at least you coded it up. So what's going to happen here is uh, when we call, I'm going to go back to the drawing of the stack diagram because that is that is what I do. That is the uh, easiest way to convey this information. I can't draw dolls, of course. And this is the technical way of doing it. And this is what you're going to be expected to know. So uh, in the recursive case, we call it on 10, 50, 40, some list. When we do that, uh, it's going to then call inside of this function call. It's going to hit this recursive case because it's not null. And it's going to call uh, on head. It's going to get the sum of the smaller list, or it's going to try by calling sum list with head. And remember that head is a pointer to the first node again. So that the list that is seen by this new version of the function when it makes its recursive call is the same head. So it sees the same list. So it's like, all right, I will sum this list for you. Let me just go ahead and first sum this list, where we're not actually doing a smaller amount of work. And that's why recursion needs to be done on a smaller amount of work. Because what's going to happen is, again, we're going to make this same call on head again, because we're not null. So in the empty list case, this function works. But in the non-empty list case, we're going to keep on building up and up and up and up in our stack. And remember, that our stack is finite. Stack's growing down. Heap is growing up. This is like low addresses. These, this is like high addresses. Not really important. But eventually, we're going to blow past that, run out of room, and we're going to run out of space. We're going to run out of memory, and so we're going to get a seg fault. Eventually. <laughs> there are two options, and uh, it depends on timing which one you think is correct. So. Uh, our computers are very fast, so we are eventually going to get a seg fault. But initially, we're going to be OK for a little while. And that little while is a few milliseconds, but it takes it's a measurable amount of time. And so C is the better answer here. I'm not going to ever ask you some kind of uh, qualify, qualified question like this on the, on the final, but the C is a better answer than B, because we are going to crash with a seg fault eventually because the stack is going to keep on going up and up and up and running out of memory, uh, memory space for itself. But uh, many, or maybe let's say a lot, a few of the recursive calls still work. The stack can hold, like, I don't know, at least a hundred function calls, right? Something like that. So it's not immediate. The seg fault is not immediate. It's a very short amount of time, though. I encourage you to code that up. So it's going to run for a very short amount of time and then crash with the seg fault. OK, that's the idea there. So make sure that uh, key lesson here, let me, let me just write that in bold. Recursive functions always need to solve smaller subproblems. And smaller is the key here. OK. That is the lesson that I want you to learn with this example. Uh, and then I think I'm good on that. I can make this bigger for you now. Whee. All right. So. Uh, I do want to give you some more recursion examples. Uh, let's see here. The first one I want to do is not actually on this slide. So let's see how much time I have and if this is going to be useful. I think we're going to be OK. So actually, here's a better idea of how much time I've taken. About a half an hour. OK. So I'm going to give you a bunch of recursive uh, examples. Let's see. Yeah. But the first one I want to do is, oh gosh, do I want to do it now or do I want to do it later? Let's build up to it. 
why not? Let's let's do these in order, and then when we get to this, I'll I'll go off on a tangent maybe. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do is calculate the nth element of a Fibonacci sequence. And what is a Fibonacci sequence, you might ask? Fibonacci sequence. It is a famous mathematical sequence, and I encourage you to look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, it either goes 0, 1, 1, 2, or it starts at 1, 1, 2. Uh, the 0 is optional. We'll just we'll keep it this way, I guess. And uh, it's the sequence behind these cool little fractal patterns that you find in nature. So it's kind of beautiful, uh, but it is also mathy, and we can calculate it. So, uh, it's just a sequence, and so let's pretend we want to find the nth number in that sequence. So we have 0, first number is 0, first number is 0, then it's 1, then it's 1, then it's 2, then it's 3, then it's 5, then it's 8, then it's 13. And the trick is, Fibonacci sequence, if you're not familiar with it, the trick to calculating it is this element is the sum of the previous two. Boop. Just like that. And that's true for every element. Okay? So 1 plus 2 makes 3. 3 plus 5 makes 8. 5 plus 8 makes 13. And that's how you get the next element in the list. So let's pretend we want to write a uh, int fib int n function. That is our declaration. And so we want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number. And the idea is uh, that it is a recursive problem. Because, oh man, what is fib? This is uh, the, do I want to do it as the first number? Let's, we're, we're computer scientists, let's start at zero. Let's say that's the zeroth number of the Fibonacci sequence. This is the first one, this is the second one, this is the third one, and on forever. Okay, so what is fib of 3 but fib of 2 plus fib of 1? This meets all of our requirements for a recursive solution. It's calling itself, and that thing that it's calling it with is getting smaller. Isn't that beautiful? So this is recursive, totally. That's the recursive case. Uh, what about the base case? Let's talk about that. So recursive case is pretty simple. What's a bit different than what we've noticed uh, before in our recursive uh, solutions. Fib of n equals, so if 3 is n, it's fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. Okay, that's the recursive case. No big deal there. Uh, a cool new thing is that we're actually calling the recursive function twice. That's not an issue, but that's pretty cool. And it's new. The base case requires a little care because, well, sure, here's the smallest Fibonacci number. We can totally say something like, yeah, the base case is when n is 0, uh, just return 0. But that doesn't actually work, because when we go and try and calculate fib of 1, what are we going to try and do? We're going to use our recursive rule. We're going to say, all right, fib of 1, yeah, that's just fib of 0. We'll hit the base case, plus fib of negative 1. And this is like, what? No, no, we don't want to do that. We don't actually want to do any of that. So the idea here is that there are two base cases, because that's... You can only start using the recursive case once you hit n equals 2. Do you see that? Uh, otherwise, you try and get negative indices, and those, don't, those, those are just not defined. All right. Uh, so there's another base case, n equals 0 case and n equal 1 case. And in the 1 case, we return 1. All right, so there's two base cases where we can immediately solve the answer without making a recursive call. All right, so I hope you see that, uh, and I'm going to code it up now. Let us go. Uh, I found a cool new theme. It's all dark. Let's make a, first of all, a folder for today. 
don't think I did that yet. And let's go inside of it. And let's see. Got nothing, of course, but let's add uh, recursion. Or, no, let's do it one by one. Fib.cpp. Dun, dun, dun. And let's say int main. Let's see out fib of five. Then five will be four, five, six. Let's do seven because we get 13. All right, so we're going to make our fib function. And I also need IO stream, don't I? And so let's make our fib function. And this is not going to be defined for any number less than zero. Uh, so you can just let it fail in that case with a seg fault, or you can uh, like check for it if n is less than zero. Be like C error. N must be non-negative. Yell at our user. All right. So otherwise, we have our two base cases. If n is equal to 0, we return 0. Else if n is equal to 1, we'll return 1. Otherwise, we are now in the recursive case. All right, and technically, we will have returned if we're not in the recursive case, so I don't really need this else statement. So if we're still here, we stuck around this far. We're definitely in the recursive case, because n wasn't 0 or 1 and it was definitely bigger than those. All right, so that's where we're at, and so now we can do our recursive case. We'll just return exactly this, because fib of n is fib of n minus one plus fib of n minus two. So go and calculate those things and return the answer. All right, so that is that. Let us compile and run. Thirteen, beautiful. All right, uh, so that's the Fibonacci sequence, and I want to talk to you uh, about something that you'll learn about in CS24. Uh, it's about computational complexity. It's a large word, and I'm not going to test you on it, uh, but it's important to understand what's going on in some of these recursive answers so that you understand why some things are not so fun, uh, and there is more to CS than just programming. All right, so let's do Fib of 7. Uh, and let's look at how it's going to make its recursive calls. Because fib of 7, remember, it's going to call fib of n minus 1 and fib of n minus 2 separately. So that'll call fib of 6, and this will call fib of 5. Yeah. And fib of 6, of course, is going to call, well, let me give myself extra room, fib of 5, and fib of 4. Fib of 5 is going to call fib of 4. And fib of 3, and fib of 5 here is going to call fib of 4, and fib of 3, and fib of 4 is going to call, feel free to fast forward here, I'm just doing this to prove a point, fib of 4 is going to call fib 3 and fib of 2, and these are all separate calls. 2 and fib of 1. And hey, we finally reached a base case there, but all of these continue. Oop. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. There is a lot of duplicated work. Fib of 7. Well, let's look at how many times fib of 5 is called. Twice. Look at, let's look at how many times fib of 4 is called. One, two, three times. Let's look at how many times fib of three is called. One, two, three, four times. And this just gets worse and worse for the smaller numbers. Because uh, fib of three is going to itself call fib of two, and there's also other fib of two sitting around here. So these are all separate calls to the fib function, and this is not very efficient. And because of that, I can prove to you that fib of like using this recursive version, uh, you can totally do this problem with a loop instead, and it'll be super fast. But if I were to do instead of fib seven, call fib one hundred,
it would take more time than the universe has existed to complete. This blows up very quickly. We're never going to get a seg fault because it's only calling at most 100 functions. It's just doing so much extra work that it'll never finish in a reasonable amount of time. It'll take millennia. And I'm serious about that. All right, so let me kill that with a control C. Back to seven. Uh, there's ways to make this faster, and that's the cons that's something that you'll talk about in a later class in CS. But uh, we don't really touch on efficiency in this class, uh, but I want to give you a flavor of what it's like if you go on. All right, so that's fun. And there's ways to make things better. Ask me about it in office hours if you'd like. Uh, all right, similar to the factorial function that we've done, let's do a to the power of b. I can't remember if I did it already. If we already did it, we're going to do it again. So like 2 to the power of 5, well, what is that? But can you find a smaller to the power of operation inside of this one? Well, yes, you can. Oop. 2 to the 5, what's that? But 2 times 2 to the 4, and here is a smaller power computation. Smaller in terms of the exponent. So let's break this down recursively, all right? So in the recursive case, two to the, or n to the m is, or no, I, I like n as the exponent for some reason, because that'll be the parameter that gets smaller. But you can make it whatever you want, don't worry. So m to the n is either m times m to the n minus one, if n is greater than zero, and it is one exactly if n is equal to zero, right? Because anything with zero power is one. So this is totally recursive because here's a smaller power computation, uh, and here's a base case. So we can code that up very quickly and very easily. So uh, I'll actually just do that entirely in Visual Studio Code. Let's call this pow.cpp. So this is two to the five, let's say. This is pow. This is pow uh, computes m to the n. All right, so. Uh, again, you can guard for if the user gave you a bad value for the exponent. Uh, I'm just going to not deal with that right now. Uh, so, base case. If, no, oh, and why do I have two m's? I shouldn't. If n is equal to zero, return one. Else, return. What do we do? Well, multiply m by the result of the recursive call, the smaller power computation. All right? And I encourage you to draw the stack diagram for these and watch why it works. We get, to re we get to assume that it's working as long as we build up the answer correctly. So m times pow of m to the n minus 1. All right? So 2 to the 5 is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 32. Unless I'm off by 1. Sure is. All right, beautiful. I encourage you to draw the stack diagram again. So let's just keep on going with these recursive examples, and they are super fun. This next one is very complicated, uh, and I'm going to introduce a new data structure for the purpose of this example, and I'm not going to test you on it, okay? So this is only for an example. I'm not going to test you on this thing that I'm about to define called a binary tree. Uh, and the reason I'm going to do it is to motivate recursion a little bit, because at the end of the day, uh, I have, you might read it in the book, but nobody really tells you why any of these things that we're learning, other than the purposes of writing a, a program, are useful. Uh, so let me give you some motivation for at least recursion. You can feel free if you just want to learn about recursion to fast forward. So one very useful example, one that's very applicable to your lives, is the C++ compiler uh, is reading your code 
and translating it right down to machine code. It reads your code in a recursive way and outputs machine code in a recursive way. Or it definitely reads your code. Uh, this is it's possible to do it this way. So don't quote me on this last part, but it's totally parsing your code is the word uh, recursively. At least the, the C compiler is, so I assume that uh, the C++ one might be. Let me just say C to cover my bases. All right? At least the C compiler is doing this. So when you read in a piece of code saying something like, I don't know, int x equals uh, foo of y plus uh, z times w. This line of code gets what's called parsed in your compiler to a kind of data structure that's called a tree that I'll define further later. Uh, and it'll look like this in memory. So it'll be like assignment, because this whole line is an assignment statement. And it's assigning this variable x to the right-hand side, which is uh, on the outermost thing, precedence, remember, it's a plus function call. And what are the two operands of plus? Well, it's a uh, foo call. It's a function call of foo with argument y. Possibly have more arguments. And then we're adding on the right-hand side the multiplication of z times w. So when the C compiler, at least, probably the C++ compiler too, or sorry, eventually it's going to give you code and it, it's going to read it uh, recursively and write a tree data structure that looks like this. Uh, and it's very easy to recursively go through this tree and do stuff uh, and output the code that does the, the multiplication. Do that first. It's a smaller little tree. And I'll talk about this in more detail in a second. Uh, and then go and finally do the plus operation. This is all a recursive uh, solution. And it's very hard to think about this in any way that is non-recursive. Uh, so the compiler itself is using a lot of recursion, and it's beautiful. All right, so that's brief segue, and let's actually get into stuff. So a tree data structure is very similar to a linked list. But with an extra pointer. So here is the struct definition of a tree node. It's just a bunch of stuff again. It is first some data. Let's let's have it hold ints again. Int data. And let's see what was the problem that I'm going to do. We're going to do the sum. Okay. Int data and then node star left or tree node star and tree node star right. So this is saying, and I'm going to draw a tree for you in a second. So here is a tree that looks like this. This is called the root of the tree. It's kind of like a, the root system of a tree drawn upside down, maybe, or just the tree itself. 50, 20, 30. Yeah. Five. All right, so here's a tree, uh, and here is the root of that tree. That's the analogous to the head of a list. It's where you start. And you can build up this tree data structure uh, in these ways. So. Initially, it has this node, and then it branches twice, not once, like a linked list, twice. So it has a left child, we say, and a right child, and each node has a left child and a right child, until we get to the ends, which then have null pointers, as their children, we say. Lots of terminology. You don't have to pay too much attention. I'm just giving you a fancy example of recursion. All right. 
So let's make this in memory. And just to make sure I'm not confusing anybody, uh, I'm going to make this entire tree on the stack, as opposed to trying to do everything on the heap, which is normally where you would do it, but uh, I don't want to confuse too many things right now. So here's what's happening. Let's make that tree that I just drew in code. And then our goal is to sum all the nodes of this tree recursively, OK? All right, so let's make the tree. Uh, we first need to make the root. So tree node root equals. And let's just start out all these left right uh, things as null, maybe. That would be helpful for me in the end, at least for the leaves. Uh, so the root's going to hold 50. Uh, and let's just call it 50, actually. 50, 20, 30, 10, and 5. All right. And so some of these are leaves, and I don't need to touch their left and right pointers. But the 50 node, for example, its left child needs to be the uh, 20 node. All right. Let's give these all the right names. So the 50's left child is a pointer to the 20 node. OK, that's what's happening there. And then its right child is a pointer to the 30 node. And 30's left child is 10, its right child is 5. All right, so now I have, and the rest are fine because 20 I've already set to have a left and right pointer of null. And so these are all, uh, these all end properly, everything else. It's just 50 and 30 that needed to have its left and right pointers changed. So now we have the tree. And let me try and draw it here just for fun. Feel free again to, pa to fast forward. This is just to make sure that this code is self-contained. So we have 50. Then on the left of that, we have 20, and then 30. And then 20 has nothing, but 30 has uh, some stuff. It's got 10 and 5. There we go. So now we have this tree. I'll call it treesum.cbp. Let's recursively sum all the nodes of this tree. OK? That's the idea. So let's do that by writing a recursive function. And the idea is at any given point. So initially, we're going to consider the entire tree. Can you find me smaller trees inside of this? I think you can. Here's one. It's a smaller tree rooted, we say, at 30. You never have to learn this terminology uh, for the final or anything. This is just for fun. And here's a smaller tree rooted at 20. And inside of that, it has another smaller tree that's empty. And inside of 30, it had another smaller tree that would held 10. And inside of that, it had two smaller trees that were both empty. I hope you see what's going on here. All right, so that's how we can recursively break down this tree. And so to sum all the nodes, I'll put it right here maybe, to sum all the nodes in the tree, recursively, sum together the left and right subtrees. Because at that point, if you make the recursive call, remember we can assume that it's going to do the right thing on the smaller solution. Boop, boop. At that point, we're going to have the entire sum. So a recursive call for this left subtree is going to give us back 20. Recursive call for this right subtree is going to do the sum, 30 plus 10 plus 5, 45. We get to assume that that's all happening for us. It's beautiful. It's still recursion. 
And the only thing that we need to do after we get back those sums is to consider the last node that we still haven't, just like the linked list sum case. We're going to add together our current node, our 50. Then add the data value of the node that we still need to consider. We call it the root node. Okay, so that's the idea. And I'm going to code this up for you, and we're going to watch it work. Uh, and I encourage you to, to think about this more uh, after you watch this. All right, so we're going to output sum, uh, I'll just call it tree sum, of the tree that starts at the top, so the 50 node. And we need to use uh, pointers just like we do, uh, because the inner bits of this tree are itself pointers. All right, so we're going to eventually return an int, tree sum. We take a tree uh, that is represented by a pointer to its root. All right, and so we're going to give back a value. And again, the base case, uh, this is like the recursive case. The base case for that, uh, we notice that we're eventually going to get to the equivalent of empty lists, empty trees. And the sum of all the nodes in an empty tree is again zero. All right, so if the tree I'm currently considering is empty, I'm going to return zero. Otherwise, recursive case. I have not yet returned in the recursive case, and so I'm going to first, uh, or I can immediately give back the answer. So I'm going to return back. What is the answer? What is the sum of all my nodes? Well, it's recursively sum the left side, sum the right side, and then add my node. Tree sum root left plus tree sum root right plus, and the one last thing we need to do to build up the answer is to add our roots data. Okay, that's all we need to do there. Uh, and so when I call this, if I can make it so that you can see all of it at once, when I call this now we should get back all of these numbers summed together, which looks like it's 115. Oops, what have I done? Oops, I said node instead of tree node. Old habits. All right, beautiful. And so the reason that's happening is because, again, when we make the recursive call on the smaller tree, we then see it from this node's point of view. So the 20 needs to sum together its nodes. Uh, it'll make the recursive calls, see that those are zero, get that back from the recursive answer, and then add its 20 and give back 20 to the initial call to sum tree. So this is a large example and I don't uh, imagine uh, or I don't think that it needs to make sense right now but it's just a fancier example of recursion and if you can understand it by uh, maybe drawing some diagrams and walking through this code yourself you'll be in a very good place for the final. Again I won't be talking about tree nodes ever again uh, I will not test you on this data structure. It was just for, uh, for sake of a fancy example. OK, so uh, in the time that we have left, here's the slide, and I don't know if we're going to get to it, uh, where we delete a value from a list recursively. So I will answer that question. I will give you a recursive answer, uh, and I'll walk through it. We just might not do it today. OK, so uh, first, well, we start maybe. Uh, first, go ahead and do this slide, output what's going to happen. So pretend that we want to delete the entire list, so everything that was ever made on the heap, uh, which is really usually the head, the tail, and all the nodes for a linked list. We want to delete all of those things, uh, and we'll eventually call the delete statement a bunch of times, right? Uh, so here, let's pretend that we have a linked list pointer called list, and we say delete list. So given that state of memory, 
what gets deleted, what is freed uh, from the heap, okay? And we'll then talk about was there a memory leak. So think about that. And assuming that you have thought about it, let us uh, figure out what's going on. So when we say delete list here, What is list? It's a pointer to a linked list object. And when we say delete, we say, all right, this held like some address, 8008 maybe. And it says, go to that address and delete the thing that we made there on the heap before in a corresponding call to new. And we made the linked list one, one thing at a time. So there were four separate calls to new, weren't there? One for this one, and one for its three nodes. And so you need four corresponding calls to delete, to delete everything. Remember that. That's very important. Uh, and so when we call delete list, well, what is list but the linked list object? That's the only thing that's going away right now. Okay? The nodes aren't going away because those were uh, a separate call to the new operator. They're, those look like new node. Whereas list looked something like new linked list. something like that. Uh, and I'll actually keep these around, so I'm going to write them cleaner. Mm. There were three of those. All right, so this delete list itself only deletes that linked list object. And so B is the correct answer here. All right, so it's not B and C, definitely not B and C, when you just say this one line, okay? You'll have to delete these nodes individually. All right, and so uh, we do have a memory leak because we just lost access to all of these three nodes, didn't we? The only way with the, that we had access to them was through the linked list object. We would have gone list head, possibly next next, right? And that would have given us access to these things. But now, since we deleted this linked list, we cannot go through it anymore to get to the actual nodes. We just lost access to them. So that's a memory leak. That's no fun. We don't like that. So you have to delete the nodes first, like we've talked about. All right, so that's the idea there. Uh, and now let me, let me check time uh, just to make sure I don't go over too much. We have like 10 minutes in a normal class time. Uh, and there is only one lecture this week, so let's go to the full time maybe. Uh, I'll just have more time to review next week. Uh, so we want to do essentially the problem in uh, your homework, in homework eight. We're going to delete from a list, call it list, every node with a certain value called value, uh, and let us use recursion to do that. And recursion is the right way because iteration is very difficult to do all of this. All right, so again, we're gonna make a helper function because the node, the node data structure is the thing that we can actually recurse on, we say. Uh, it's a recursive data structure, whereas linked lists need some extra help. Uh, and we're going to, instead of doing the fancy thing where the node star head was also a reference, uh, we'll also return a node star. All right, and let's talk about why. So here's the example. Let's pretend that we have this list right here. Uh, here's our head. Our favorite list, one, two, three. And let's pretend that the value we want to delete is two. And so we are going to eventually delete this node. All right? So the reason we want to return a node star, actually, it makes more sense uh, intuitively if I say, let's instead pretend that we want to delete the one node. And this is the reason we return a node star because the head now changes, right? So uh, 
by returning a node star, we are essentially returning a new linked list. And this is lowercase linked list, it's not the data structure, it's we represent a linked list by a, by a pointer to the first node of it, right? And so this entire list needs to change to become smaller, and the new head needs to be right here. So when we call delete recursively on this big list, we want to get back this smaller list, and the reason, or the way we can get that back is by returning the address of the start of that smaller list, right? This is like the new head. All right, and so we're able to return a new linked list by returning a node star. That's the that's the idea, or an updated linked list. However, you want to think about it. Uh, so, let me let me keep checking my time here. What we want to do is let's first talk about how we're going to break this down recursively. All right, so. Again, pretending that this is our list, and I'm going to change value in a second. Uh, but let's talk about the base case and the recursive case. The base case is easier. Take a second to think about it yourself. What is the case where we can immediately do a deletion and be done with it? Or possibly not do a deletion? And that is the key. So. The base case for a linked list, you should always be thinking single element list or empty list. One of those two is usually the correct answer. And here, uh, it's a bit simpler to think about, and it works in more cases, to think about the base case as the empty list. So in the case of an empty list, remember our problem. Let me state the problem. Delete all the nodes in a list with a certain value. So, how do you delete all the nodes with, in a list with a certain value inside of the empty list? How do you delete all the nodes with the, with the value 1? You do absolutely nothing, right? So, return back the empty list. And so that's the beauty of recursion. You just did all the deletion, you're done with it. Right? So the recursive case now is the fancier one. Uh, and it takes some thought. So, uh, in the recursive case, uh, can if, first of all, can you find the smaller problem? So let's pretend that our list look like this, just for example's sake, and I still want to delete the value 1. Can you find me a smaller version of this problem P that involves deleting all the nodes in the list with value 1, let's say? And I think that you can, because here in our bigger list, there's another smaller list inside of that that we also need to do some work on, right? We need to get rid of that one. And so the idea is, we can recursively delete from the smaller list and then build back up our final bigger list, possibly containing the head node, possibly not containing the head node. All right, so let's break this down. Can I get some lists in here? No pun intended. All right, so in the recursive case, uh, when we make a recursive call, on the smaller list, we can assume that we will get back that same list with all the uh, nodes with value, with data equal to value that we passed along deleted. All right, so in this case, we're going to delete all the ones. So when we make that recursive call on that smaller list, we're going to get back, uh, we get the list back as a pointer to its head, right? So the idea is this list, this 113, I'll draw it down here, just simpler. This is our list. It looks like that where x is null. Uh, the idea is we're going to make the recursive call on this smaller list and the recursive function we get to assume gives us back, assuming we're deleting three, this list. All right? All right, it's going to delete all the ones inside of that list for us. That's what recursion is going to do. We get to assume it solves the problem of deleting the ones. All right? So we're going to get back a pointer to the head of a list with all the ones taken out of it. 
or whatever value we wanted to, to delete. All right, at that point, we need to build up the answer. So using that list, to the smaller list, we need to build up the correct solution for the bigger list. And here is where you notice the difference. The only node that we haven't considered, as usual for linked lists, is the head. And when we're doing this problem of deletion, we can either uh, include the head, if it's not the value that we want to delete, or we can get rid of it if it is the value that we want to delete. And in this case, in my example it is, but it doesn't have to be. So, two cases. If the head is uh, depending on whether the head is the node that needed, uh, or if the head contains the value that we wanted to, to delete. Okay, so let me again check my time. I don't want to go over by too much. I still have four minutes. I don't think we'll get to programming it this time, but I will at least give you the entire uh, option here. So in the end, if we need to delete the node, the result for the larger list is just the result of the smaller list. After head is deleted, of course. So what that means is we got back this smaller list that was correct. It got its one deleted out of it. And our final answer actually is that list itself. It's just the list three because this, this list has two ones in it. We did not want to include our head, and so we'll delete it. All right, so that's the first case. It's our final answer. If we don't need to delete our head, that means that maybe we had the case where it was like two one, three, null. And again, we're going to get back by calling recursively the correct list, three. And then we want to add our two to this list. You see that? So that we end up with two, three, null. And that's the reason. That's the reason we have to return a node star. Because that next pointer is going to change, potentially. reset its next pointer because it's no longer going to go to this one anymore. We just deleted that node in the recursive call. It's going to go to the new head that we got back from that list. So we're going to set it up like this. We're going to reset its next pointer. Our head's next pointer to start at the head of the smaller list that we got back from the recursive call. So this is a lot of words. Uh, it's actually quite simple to implement this, but I'm gonna save it until next time, I guess. So I encourage you to use this, use these words and this example to go and implement, if you didn't already do it for your homework, uh, this answer, uh, this function with this signature. Okay, go through and do that. And then this is where we will pick up uh, next lecture. So I will see you then.